Of course, the positive shifts that occur in normal, unconscious daytime breathing translate to all the opposite things that we talked about when you are over-breathing during the daytime. So what I just described in terms of the carbon dioxide tolerance test and the exercise using box breathing to restore normal patterns of breathing and not over-breathe and therefore not eliminate too much carbon dioxide is exactly the two tests that were incorporated into a study that my laboratory did in collaboration with our associate chair of psychiatry at Stanford School of Medicine, Dr. David Spiegel, who's also been a guest on this podcast previously. And that study explored box breathing, but it also explored other forms of breathing and actually compared those forms of deliberate breathing to meditation as a means to explore what are going to be the minimal effective doses and most effective ways to chronically reduce stress around the clock and improve mood and improve sleep. So the study I'm referring to was just published recently. It's entitled Brief Structured Respiration Practices Enhance Mood and Reduce Physiological Arousal. We will also provide a link to this paper in the show note captions. What this study really focused on was a simple question, which is, what is the shortest and most effective practice that people can use in order to reduce their levels of stress, not just during that breathwork practice or meditation practice, but around the clock, 24 hours a day, including improvements in sleep. And we were excited to do this study because many studies had explored how meditation, or in some cases, fewer studies, had explored how breathwork can impact different brain states or bodily states. But very few studies had explored how those breathwork or meditation practices influenced body-brain states around the clock when people were not performing the particular meditation or breathwork practice. The reason we were able to do this study was really fortunate. Um, the folks over at WHOOP were generous enough to donate a bunch of WHOOP straps, which allowed us to measure heart rate variability, a number of other different physiological parameters. We also got subjective reports about people's mood and feelings of well-being. We got data about their sleep pinged to us from re remote locations. So these people, rather than being brought to the laboratory and being in a very artificial circumstance, the laboratory, uh, as much as we like to think our laboratory is realistic, uh, we have virtual reality and things like that. There's nothing as realistic as the real world. And so we were able to have more than 100 subjects out in the real world, living their real lives, pinging back to us data all the time, 24 hours a day, so that we could measure how their different interventions that we asked them to do, breathwork practices or meditation practices, were impacting physiological parameters, and they were also informing us regularly about their subjective mood, et cetera. We got a lot of data, as you can imagine, and the basic takeaway from the study was twofold. First of all, we discovered that deliberate breathwork practices done for about five minutes per day across the course of about a month led to greater reductions in stress then did a five minute a day meditation practice. Now, that is not to say that meditation is not useful. In fact, there are dozens, if not hundreds of papers, including one particular, I should say, particularly beautiful study from Wendy Suzuki's lab at New York University showing that a daily 10 to 13 minute mindfulness meditation practice can greatly improve focus, memory, and a number of other things related to cognition and learning. However, the research on meditation has shown us that meditation, at least short meditations, mainly lead to improvements in focus and memory, not so much reductions in stress, although they do lead to reductions in stress. What we found was that any number of different breathwork practices, and we explored three, done for five minutes a day, outperformed meditation in terms of the ability of breathwork to reduce stress around the clock compared to meditation. The three types of breath work that we explored also showed different effects. I should mention the three types of breath work that we compared were box breathing of the sort that you just learned about. We compared that to something called cyclic sighing, which involves two inhales through the nose to get maximally inflated lungs followed by a long exhale. I'll return to that in a moment. That was repeated for five minutes at a time for each session. And a third breathwork practice, which was cyclic hyperventilation, which as the name suggests, involves people inhaling deeply through the nose, then exhaling passively through the mouth, and then repeating inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth, repeating that for 25 cycles, one cycle being 
an inhale and an exhale. So that equals one cycle. Repeating that for 25 cycles, then exhaling all their air and holding their breath with lungs empty for about 15 to 30 seconds, and then repeating inhale, exhale, cyclic hyperventilation for the duration of five minutes. Okay, so people were divided into these different groups, either mindfulness meditation where they sat, they were not told to control their breathing in any specific way, they closed their eyes, they focused their attention on a region just behind their forehead. One group did that, the other group did cyclic sighing, another group did box breathing, another group did cyclic hyperventilation. As any sort of clinical trial like this ought to, we then swapped people into different groups so they served as their own control so we could evaluate any kind of between and within individual variability. Again, there are a lot of data in this paper, but the takeaway was that for the sake of stress reduction around the clock and for the sake of improving sleep and mood, the most effective practice of the four practices that we examined was the cyclic sighing. Again, cyclic sighing is performed the following way. You inhale through the nose as deeply as you can. Then you do a second inhale immediately afterwards to try and maximally inflate the lungs. In fact, that's what happens. We know that during that second inhale, even if it's just a very sharp, short inhale, the extra physical vigor that's required to generate that second inhale causes those avioli of the lungs, which may have collapsed and indeed in between breaths and often even just through the course of the day. And especially if we get stressed, those avioli of the lungs start to collapse. And because they're damp on the inside, they're, they have a little bit of fluid. They're like a balloon with a little bit of fluid in, in the middle. It takes a little bit of physical force to put, to pop those open. Now you're not literally exploding them pop, but you're reinflating them with air. And then you perform the long exhale through the mouth until lungs are empty. So it looks exactly like this. <sighs> now, we know that one single physiological sigh of the sort that I just described performed at any time of day under any conditions, whether or not you're about to walk on stage to give a talk or you're in a meeting and you're feeling stressed or you're in a conversation that's very stressful or you can feel stress mounting because you're in traffic or any number of psychological or physical stressors that may be approaching you or you feel are oppressing you, doing one physiological sigh of the sort that I just described is the fastest physiologically verified way that we are aware of to reduce your levels of stress and to reintroduce calm. That is to shift your autonomic nervous system from a state of heightened levels of autonomic arousal that is sympathetic nervous system as it's called is at a higher activation level than the so-called parasympathetic nervous system. Again, sympathetic nervous system having nothing to do with sympathy has everything to do with so-called fight or flight, although it controls other things too, including positive arousal. And the parasympathetic nervous system often referred to as the rest and digest system, although it does other things too. Is associated with calming. Those two things are always in kind of push-pull with one another, like a seesaw or push-pull, however you want to think about it. One physiological sigh, meaning that big, deep inhale, short second inhale, also through the nose, and then long exhale to completely lungs empty, is known to restore the level of balance in the sympathetic, parasympathetic neural circuitries and is the fastest way to reintroduce calm. That's one physiological sigh. In this study, what we asked was that people perform that repeatedly, so-called cyclic sighing for the duration of five minutes. And the people who did that cyclic sighing for five minutes a day, regardless of the time of day that they did it, experienced the greatest reductions in stress, not just during the practice, but around the 24 hour cycle. And it translated again to all sorts of positive subjective changes, improvements in sleep lower resting heart rate at all times of day. So this is important. Again, this study was not just exploring what happens during meditation or breath work, cyclic sighing, et cetera. It was exploring how the changes that occur during that practice translate to changes in breathing and heart rate, mood, et cetera, throughout the 24 hour cycle. So the takeaway here is twofold. First of all, if you're somebody who wants to improve your mood and reduce your overall levels of stress, and you only have five minutes a day to invest in that, Hopefully you're doing all the other things like trying to get proper sleep and exercise, social connection, nutrition, et cetera. Sunlight in the morning, of course. Can't leave that out. But if you were going to devote five minutes a day to a stress reduction practice that is now supported by data to translate to reductions in stress around the clock, 
The data say that you would want to invest that in cyclic sighing, that is double inhale through the nose, extended exhale through the mouth until your lungs are empty, then repeat for five minutes a day. You, of course, if you like, could do meditation. It still had positive effects, meaning it reduced stress, although not as much as cyclic sighing. You could do box breathing if you want for the purpose of reducing stress. All the practices we explored did reduce stress, but cyclic sighing performed for five minutes a day had the most robust and pervasive effect in reducing stress, improving mood, and improving sleep. That's the first message of the study. The second takeaway is that one physiological sigh, that's right, just one physiological sigh, where you inhale deeply through the nose, another inhale through the nose to maximally inflate the alveoli of the lungs, and then you exhale to completely lungs empty, and then go back to normal breathing, is the fastest way to introduce a level of calm and to reduce your overall levels of stress in real time. And this is very important. I think that out there these days, we hear a lot about stress reduction techniques and most all of the stress reduction techniques that have been explored, everything from massage to meditation to breath work uh, to a hot shower uh, to a foot rub will calm you down. The question is, do they calm you down just during that practice? Great if it does. But does it also translate to reduced levels of stress at other times in the 24-hour cycle and other positive effects as well? So one physiological sigh is a very efficient way to adjust that ratio of sympathetic to parasympathetic activation and immediately bring about calm. So it's excellent for real-time control of stress. 